Hello and welcome to the Journal, I'm Steve Kendall. In the wake of Issue 1's defeat on August 8th and the approval of two statewide issues to appear on the November 2023 ballot, where do we head now? What's going on in Columbus? What's the thought of the legislators and the party power makers? What's their thoughts on what's going to happen? We're joined by Karen Kassler, host of the State of Ohio, which you can see every Sunday at noon here on WBGU-PBS. Karen, thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Hey, it's great to talk to you. Thanks. Yeah, and issue one, obviously, we're a couple of weeks away. I mean, the election now seems a long ways in the past. It's not been quite two weeks as we're talking today, but, but issue one continues to sort of roll through the future of Ohio because one side says, okay, this is what it meant. The other side, here's what the decision meant. But the talk's not over. The discussion's not over about what this will mean and how it will impact as we move toward future elections. So uh, talk a little about, you had folks on your show talk about this, but issue one turned out to be a different, kind of a different ending than people were saying. The polls said it was going to pass, and the reality was it failed by what we considered almost a landslide margin, uh, which is unusual in the state of Ohio for a constitutional amendment to see that kind of negative reaction. There wasn't a whole lot of reliable polling on this. I think mm. there were two polls, one showing it was close, but mm -hmm. uh, it was passing by a little bit, and the other showing it was failing. Yeah. But yeah, the overall results, and we could kind of see this as we were going forward through early voting and through the ads and, and some of the voices that were speaking out. This coalition that was opposed to issue one, which to remind everybody, was the proposal that would raise the voter threshold to approve constitutional amendments to 60% from a simple majority, where it is now and it has been for more than 100 years, and would also require groups and citizens to gather signatures from all 88 counties, mm -hmm. not 44, which is in, in current law. And so that was the essential, the, the essence of the proposal. And we were seeing some of the, the, the people who were speaking out against this, this coalition that opposed it. I mean, it was Democratic groups. It was there were some prominent Republicans, mm -hmm. uh, all four of Ohio's living ex-governors, two Republicans and two Democrats, five former attorneys general, including Republicans and Democrats. Uh, you had even some conservative groups like the Ohio Roundtable, which is a conservative group out of the Cleveland area. The Libertarian Party was against mm. this. I mean, it was a, it was a huge coalition that spoke out against it. And the ad war, I mean, we're talking about, you know, millions of dollars in ads for an election in the middle of summer that wasn't even on the schedule until May. It was really right. kind of amazing. Yeah. And, and of course, then you had to. And one of the things that, that would sort of flash by occasionally was, oh, we weren't supposed to have any other August elections. That was that that Legis General Assembly had said those are a bad idea. Never, never again. Although I noticed that I believe it was Frank LaRose said, well, we just meant for local issues. We didn't mean state issues. But I think it appeared that sort of resonated with people who were like, wait a minute, six months ago, August was a horrible idea. Now we're having an August election. And that seemed to make people think, well, now, wait a minute, what's, what's so urgent now that wasn't urgent in December last year? Yeah, I think that was kind of one of the things that got people who are paying attention to this really mm -hmm. questioning. Uh, that law that banned most August special elections passed last year, was signed earlier this year. The first election that it affected was the May primary because it required voters to show photo ID. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a law that did an awful lot of things when it came to elections. But the spanning of August special elections, when the legislature set the issue one proposal for an August special election. There was a lawsuit because we can't mm -hmm. have an election in Ohio without yeah, a lawsuit. lawsuit right? <laughs> yeah. And um, the Ohio Supreme Court ruled that law did not apply to legislators who were trying to put an amendment before voters, oh. which for some people seemed a little bit hypocritical mm -hmm. uh, against what the law actually was intended to do because it was intended to eliminate elections that have low turnout and high cost. Right. And this election, potentially, there was $16 million in the budget for this election. Don't know if it got all spent. We'll be finding mm -hmm. that out hopefully soon. But the turnout was good for an August special election, 38.5%. Yes. But it's still only 38.5%. Right. And, and yeah. that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty low in terms of raw numbers. Yeah, a typical election. And then, and then if you look at, of course, the, the last, the August 22 election, which was uh, legislative primaries, uh, General Assembly primaries. I mean, the turnout there was incredibly low, even lower than a typical August. Yeah, like so that, right that's, around 8%. yeah, that's like an outlier completely. But it showed the difference in an issue that even like this, which was extremely, you know, presented as presumably uh, extremely important, 
uh, still only, as you said, got less than a 40% turnout, which does speak to August elections to some degree as being these ones that sort of fall in this sort of black hole sort of a thing. Um, it was interesting because there was, of course, obviously, uh, a, it was almost as you described it, a bipartisan opposition to it, as you said, a broad spectrum of, of entities that normally don't agree on a lot of things, and yet in this one they seem to agree that they didn't believe this was a good idea to pass this the issue one. Right, and there, uh, the arguments have ranged from hey, this would be something that would give the minority power over the majority because it would just take 40, 41 percent of voters to say no for an amendment to not pass. Mm -hmm. So there was real concern about, well, the power of my vote to pass a constitutional amendment could potentially be diminished by this. Right. But then there were also some arguments that, hey, if you want to do this, and some people do want to make it harder to amend mm -hmm. Ohio's constitution. It's already hard enough, but some people want to make it harder. Is this the right time to rush this through mm -hmm. it with virtually no education? Because there wasn't time to do a whole lot of that. Right. And, and a turnout of 38 and a half percent, would that really be fair to make such a sweeping change to the Constitution with so few voters actually making that change? Yeah, and, and you make a good point because the argument for August was people don't pay attention to it, they don't turn out, and as I said, even this important an issue generated less than a 40 percent turnout across the state, which kind of speaks to maybe they were right about the August elections back in December and yet still tried to sort of go around that to do this one this year. Uh, but it's very yeah. Clear why they did in, mm -hmm. in August. I mean, sure. they were aiming for the November ballot, looking at what's going to be on the November ballot, which we now know is going to be the abortion and reproductive rights amendment. Mm -hmm. they, it was very clear that they wanted to have the 60% threshold in place before that abortion rights amendment, mm -hmm. because in other red states, abortion rights have been upheld, but not by 60%. Right. And so while you had some lawmakers saying this is about more than abortion, it's also about redistricting, which I know we'll talk about mm -hmm, in a little yeah. bit, there was still this drumbeat of this mm -hmm. is about the amendment on abortion that's coming up, and this is why it needs to pass. And that was the message that I think a lot of people who voted for issue one got. Mm -hmm. and, and when you describe that, too, because I know in, in watching the state of Ohio, uh, there was a list of states that were traditionally, are not traditionally, are red states, that passed reproductive rights, and those margins were generally 53 to 57 percent, somewhere in that in that range. Because um, some people said, "Well, why is 60 such an arbitrary number?" Well, you could look at the results of some of those because there were surprises. Uh, I don't think anybody, when they looked at Kansas, said, "Well, Kansas is going to uphold reproductive rights." It's a very conservative state, and yet that was a 56, 50 percent yes margin. Um, but we come back, we can talk a little more about that because obviously you interviewed a lot of the players in this who were not only talking about what happened on August 8th, but what they think will happen moving forward. So we can talk a little more about issue one, which we'll be talking about for quite a while, obviously. Back with Karen Kassler from the state of Ohio here on The Journal in just a moment. Thank you for staying with us on The Journal. Our guest is Karen Kassler, the host of the state of Ohio, which you can see every Sunday at noon here on WBGU PBS. Um, Karen, you, of course, spent an entire show talking about issue one the Sunday after the election. Uh, and I, I think one of the things that, as you were talking with various people, this isn't just about what happened on August 8th. There is still a discussion about what this means going downstream for other legislation, other constitutional amendments. Um, I know one, of, I think it might have been Matt Huffman said, well, we'll have to revisit this kind of thing regarding the Constitution, but maybe in a different time, a different mindset or whatever. So. It isn't like it, this is never going to come back up again, it seems. There will probably be an effort to change how we amend the Constitution downstream again. Um, this effort obviously failed for whatever reasons. Uh, so uh, what's your feeling when you talk to them that they, they haven't given up on changing the way we amend the Constitution, have they? I think it was a really interesting thing to hear him say that right mm -hmm. after he knew that 57% of Ohio voters had rejected it, to bring that back up and say, hey, we're going to we're going to do mm -hmm. this again. I think that is an interesting <laughs> strategy to bring that up right then. But this is an idea that's actually been brought up before. Mm -hmm. It was discussed in the Constitutional Modernization Commission back in 2013. There have been other proposals to raise that voter threshold in previous legislatures. They just haven't gone anywhere. Mm -hmm. They went somewhere this time because, again, there was this abortion access amendment that's coming in November. But also there's some other things. I mean, redistricting, for instance, mm -hmm. when uh, Former, when Republican former Chief Justice Maureen O'Connor left the Ohio Supreme Court, she had to because of term limits, 
She said she really didn't like the way that the process went, and so she wanted to see an independent commission take over redistricting. That's another thing that Republican mm -hmm. lawmakers really don't want to see happen. And so putting the idea of that 60 percent voter threshold out there, they wanted to do that as soon as they possibly could. They tried for uh -huh. May, didn't happen. They got to August. But now, you know, the idea of bringing that back right now, especially mm -hmm. since they've claimed that voters were confused and that's why they voted it down. Well, I think for a lot of voters, they weren't confused at all. Mm. And the idea of somehow you, you can bring that back so quickly, just I think Republicans need to figure out why people voted no if they want to try this again. Mm. Yeah, and I, I know when you and you were talking with various people like Matt Huffman, David Pepper, Mark Weaver, uh, people from both sides of the aisle. Uh, part of the discussion was that, well, we believe that because of the confusion and the mixed messaging, maybe on the yes side, that confused people even more. We had this limited time frame, but a lot of it still felt like the limited time frame was almost someone else's fault. And they didn't <laughs> want to say the name, at least not in the, in the interviews that you did, but there was an implication that, well, because of these Republicans that opposed it, that gave other people a place to then say, well, if Republicans don't like it, then I don't like it either, because their own parties opposing most, as you said, that coalition of people that normally would side with the Republicans on an issue were not there. And it was almost, it was like, we're blaming them for it, not the fact that the voters maybe just didn't like the, what we were trying to do or what the language said. So did, yeah, yeah, as I, you it, said, clarifying the it, message, finding out why people voted no and saying, well, it's because people on our own side said vote no, that's why people voted no. Well, that they should have that much power over people, but okay, yeah. It is interesting to hear the reasoning and, and mm -hmm. even the blaming that's going on. There's, right. there's a lot of blaming among Republicans on why this failed, because Republicans, the party and leading Republicans that all backed it, they said they were voting for it, and yet it failed. And so Matt Huffman had a couple of different reasons on election night why it failed. Mm -hmm. He mentioned that there were prominent Republicans like former Attorney General and Auditor Betty Montgomery, former Governor Bob Taft, former Governor John Kasich, who should have been speaking for issue one, who were against it. I'm not sure that really resonates with a lot of voters, though. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the other thing that he said was that there wasn't enough time to build a winning campaign for issue one. Again, they voted it onto the ballot in May. It went onto the ballot in August, and voters rejected it. There have been other, many, many other mm. examples of times when lawmakers have put something before voters and they didn't have much time and it still passed. Last year, for instance, in 2022, there were two constitutional amendments that were put before voters on non-citizens voting and on bail reform. They were voted on in earlier in the year, I think February, and then they mm -hmm. went on the ballot. No, I think they were voted on in August maybe, and then they went on the uh, no. ballot in November, November, and they both passed. So, you know, yeah. even the one of the two amendments on redistricting, mm -hmm. uh, that was put before voters by the legislature in very short order from the time they passed it and voters approved it. So it's an interesting thing to hear uh, a lawmaker who says that's the reason when, of course, he was the one, one of the many that set the timeline. He helped put right. it on the ballot and yet, then later, later says, well, we didn't have enough time to build a winning campaign. Yeah, and, and it does make the argument, as you said, that there were things that have operated in this same sort of shortened window, if you want to call it that, that were approved. So it wasn't simply the amount of time, there was something deeper than that that went on. Um, it was interesting though, I know when you, when you talked to uh, Matt Huffman when you were interviewing him that he said, you know, we're not done with reproductive rights. Whatever happens November happens November. But again, almost like in a way saying, the voters will vote the way they are, but we're not gonna, we're, depending on how it comes out, we're not gonna, if it isn't the way we want it, we'll revisit this again. Uh, in some form or fashion. Again, speaks to that thing of like, well, we're going to talk about how we amend the Constitution again at a time when obviously 57% of Ohio and said, we don't like this idea and, and implied that we know what you're trying to do here and we don't like it. And yet he doubled down on constitutional amendment changing and reproductive rights, uh, the two things that probably drove the no voters. And yet yeah. somehow they're, they're, that's just sort of sliding by somehow. Yeah, it, it really was kind of amazing to hear him talk about, for instance, if the abortion rights amendment does pass in mm -hmm. November, that there might be a, an attempt to try to pull that back. Right. And once again, once you put something before voters and they vote in a particular way to try to put that again before voters and expect a different result, 
is kind of an interesting perspective. Yeah. Yeah. But I will note that the next time there will be an opportunity to put something like that before voters, we in March. Mm -hmm. And because it, we're coming up on a presidential year, primaries are in March rather right. than in May. And this March primary is going to feature two very high profile Republican races for president, right. the nomination and the nomination for U.S. Senate. So there's going to be a lot of Republican voters and a lot of Republican primary voters who are definitely on the further right side than many mm -hmm. Republicans who will be voting in March. So uh -huh. I, I don't know if that makes a difference here or not, but it's certainly something to think about. Yeah. And depending on because <laughs> it would be interesting to see if they did something late in the legislative session or in the lame duck and go, well, you know, we didn't have enough time in the, you know, the, in this August 2023 election, but between the lame duck session in March is plenty of time to deliver our message for, for those sort of <laughs> things. Um, we come back, obviously, you mentioned gerrymandering, and I know you had Maureen O'Connor on, as you said, was really one of the people that, you know, on the state Supreme Court now off because of term limits, who really kept saying no to what the legislature was trying to, or the, the commission was trying to do with setting up districts. And obviously we're going to be revisiting that because we didn't get it done the way everybody thought it might get done. So we come back, we can talk about that. And maybe whatever other pieces we want to talk was obviously uh, issue one deals with uh, coming in November, recreational marijuana, which will be a law and not a constitutional amendment. Uh, and there was even some discussion about what we'll do if that passes, I thought was kind of interesting too. Uh, back in just a moment with Karen Kassler, host of the State of Ohio here on The Journal. You're with us here on The Journal with Karen Kassler, host of the State of Ohio. Uh, real briefly on issue one, I know there was a discussion afterwards with both sides, and I know you asked the question to several people. Um, does this change Ohio's status as basically being a red state back to being a swing state? Is this a different roadmap now for Democrats and Republicans, given the coalition that opposed this, is that a longer term thing or is this just a one time sort of this issue drew those groups together and then they'll go back to being where they were on other issues? I think Ohio is clearly a red state. I mean, look at, looking back at the last several election cycles, there's no question that Ohio is a red state. Mm -hmm. I think this shows maybe the limits of mm -hmm. what some Republican voters want, but I don't think there's any way that you could look at 38 percent, 38 and a half percent turnout and decide that that is somehow a major change for Ohio's political climate. It, it does potentially give Democrats the opportunity to show where they could gain some strength mm. potentially, especially in areas where they've lost strength, like in the Youngstown area and the Toledo area. Right. But Ohio's still a red state. I think there's no question. Mm. But this fall's vote is gonna be very interesting because there are no statewide candidates. Right. And so to have abortion rights and legalization of marijuana before voters with no political candidates leading the way, we could get a really interesting picture ah. of what Ohio is thinking about this thing. Yeah, it will sort of talk, it'll be sort of the culture war vote kind of in a way that should we legalize recreational marijuana? Should we put reproductive rights into the constitution? So two issues that float around. I know obviously there's gonna be a lot of advertising, a lot of contentiousness around those two issues. Uh, but yeah, and it's interesting you point out the 38% because on one hand, that's not too far from the 41% that could have prevented a constitutional amendment from becoming law. So on one hand, you, yeah, it's, it's interesting that that doesn't seem like a fair sample of the voter population, yet it wasn't that far from what issue one would have put in place. So we'll mm -hmm. just have to see how that plays out. Um, recreational marijuana uh, is on the ballot. It's going to go on as a law, which you, you were real clear about that in the show which means it is subject then to reversal or modification by the General Assembly. Uh, what's the, I know that came up when you were talking with people on both sides of the aisle, mainly on the Republican side, that they were kind of saying, well, you know, we will have to look at that. If it passes, we may modify that. Uh, that again seems a little interesting because if voters say, we like this idea, is it the legislators, legislature's responsibility to say, well, no, that's, you were wrong about that. I mean, it, it does fly in the face of the whole issue one thing in a way that, well, the voters said this, but we really don't think they understood what was going on. Is that the argument they'll make about, legis about recreational marijuana? Well, they didn't really understand the ramifications. So at what point do you quit trusting how people vote if you're a politician? I guess never, you never trust the people's vote as a politician. I don't know. 
I, I know there are a lot of high profile Republicans who mm -hmm. don't want to see marijuana legalized. Mm -hmm. There are some Republicans who do want to see marijuana legalized. And this vote potentially in the fall could really bring out a lot of younger voters mm -hmm. who are concerned both about legalization of marijuana and reproductive rights. So I think that this could be a very, I, I think this is going to be one of the most talked about elections mm -hmm. in Ohio in a very long time because of these two important issues. But, you know, of course, the backers of the legalization issue say it's going to pass, by such overwhelming numbers that the legislature wouldn't dare try to repeal it. I I don't know if that's mm. necessarily the case. Yeah. If there's enough of a, a strong group of people who want to see it. Yeah. So if, I, I don't know if there's enough of a group of legislators who want to see marijuana stay the way it is, where we've got medicinal marijuana and that's it. Uh, the opposition is going to be potentially pretty big here as well. Mm. There's already a group of uh, uh, children's hospitals and law enforcement, possibly manufacturers joining in on that who are opposed, and certainly the, the dispensaries that exist, they're going to be concerned about this as well. Sure, and I know you interviewed on the show um, a mother whose son had gone to, I, I want to say California, but don't quote me on that, who said, yeah. you know, his life changed when he, when he was in a state where there was rec recreational marijuana, and it wasn't a good ending, and she said, I just don't think it's a good idea to turn recreational marijuana loose in Ohio. So they'll be, you know, she'll probably be in an ad probably, I'm guessing, and, or maybe, you know, it, but it, it speaks to an issue that's every bit as contentious in its own way as reproductive rights. So you've got those two almost national issues on the ballot in Ohio, and everybody from all over the country, all the news media will be here watching what happens in Ohio again. So in one way, we'll be sort of a little bit of a bellwether state again with regard to that. So that'll be interesting. That'll be interesting. I think that that, that is really a, a good point. The whole idea of how Ohio views this mm -hmm. could potentially show how other, how it's being viewed across the country. Though Ohio's population is older mm -hmm. and it's less diverse than other states, which is why we've lost our bellwether status essentially. Ah. But to, to really see where Ohioans fall on this is going to be very interesting and there's going to be a lot of money. I mean, if you didn't like the ads for mm. issue one, you're really not going to like the ad war on issue one and issue two, which is going to be, we're going to find out later this week, by the time this airs, we'll know which one is issue one and which one is issue yeah, two. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see because, yeah, it will attract, as a media attention from all over the country because of, uh, because of the issues that are there. Um, one of the things we've touched on as we've gone through this is uh, gerrymandering, and one side calls it gerrymandering, the other one calls it redistricting. Um, obviously, Maureen O'Connor thinks it's been gerrymandered, and she obviously, when she was on the Supreme Court, said, no, 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 your maps are wrong, they're not good, they're not good, they're not good, they're unconstitutional. Um, she's no longer in that position, but now she's part of a group that says, we've got to rethink this redistricting set of rules that we currently have because they just don't work. Uh, that issue is going to keep coming back too because we have to re we're going to have to redistrict again because of the way we didn't do it the last time with the with the rules from the amendments that were in place. Uh, what's your how is that going to play out? Because that's another issue that really affects what goes on in the state. Um, it didn't attract uh, as much attention maybe as some of these other issues, but it's going to be out there again. And both sides had opinions on what should or shouldn't be done. I know I think it was David or Mark Weaver said, well. She's just wrong about it. it what we have seen is working fine. We don't need to change it, more or less. That's not exact words. Uh, she, on the other hand, said, no, no, the system's broken. It didn't work, and we've got to do something differently. A citizen's commission, nonpartisan as much as is possible. Don't put politicians on there. Uh, what's, the, what's the thought on, on where that's going to go now? Because you think we were done with it, but we're not, obviously. Well, certainly the Republicans who supported the, the maps that the Ohio Supreme Court ruled five times at the state level and then twice uh, at the federal, uh, the congressional map, were unconstitutionally gerrymandered. The Republicans who supported those maps are going to be opposed to this process. And they'll point out things like Ohioans had the opportunity to put an independent commission in charge of redistricting in 2004 when they voted it down. Mm -hmm. And so there's a real question about whether, uh, what the accountability is for an independent commission. Well, the accountability really kind of didn't exist for the members of the redistricting commission that passed the unconstitutional maps. But uh, the, the real, there's some real questions about the complexity of this proposal. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking about a 15 member citizens commission. And again, no, like you just said, no current or former politicians or lobbyists, anybody who's a professional partisan couldn't mm -hmm. be on that board. 
who does that leave out potentially? Who does that leave that could be on, be on the right. board? Um, and the, the whole process is very clearly defined. But Republicans are going to point out that the process that exists now, they think worked fine. It was the Supreme Court's viewing of it that they thought was problematic. Okay. So, yeah. you know, I, I think there's a lot that uh, this is going to, there's a lot of attention mm. for this amendment, uh, if it's even approved, because it has, it's just started right now. Right. And we haven't even gotten to yeah. the point where it's going to be on the ballot. Yeah. Well, we're going to have to leave it there because obviously we've, we've covered a lot of territory here. And the Supreme Court's different now than it was when Maureen O'Connor was there. So that's one less speed bump, depending on your perspective, to go through. So, Karen, thank you so much for being here. We always appreciate the fact that you're available to us to uh, provide a lot of insight into this. Um, you can check us out at WBGU.org. You can watch us every week on WBGUPS Thursdays at 8 o'clock. We'll see you again next time. Good night and good luck.